A great dental assistant is invaluable to us. We've only got two hands as, as dentists. Working as a dental assistant takes a big part in the dental field. A lot of things that doctors need us to be there in order for them to function. One of the best things you can do in our industry is taking care of people. It may start with a morning meeting. The dental assistant will then set up the operatory treatment rooms. He or she greets and seats the patient. Then the patient's medical history is reviewed and the patient's blood pressure is taken. Personal protective equipment is put on and the assistant then may take and develop x-rays as requested by the dentist and allowed by state regulations. Impressions are taken as needed and requested by the dentist and a study model is completed. When the dentist is examining the patient, the dental assistant is seated beside the patient and performs the duties required by the dentist. This may also include passing and retrieving instruments, using the high volume evacuator or suction and air water syringe, and recording information in the patient's chart. Proper seating is encouraged as ergonomic principles play a vital role in forehanded dentistry. Assistance is provided when the dentist administers anesthesia or applies a rubber dam. In some states, the dental assistant may apply the rubber dam. A dental assistant needs to be familiar with the hand pieces and instruments used in the dental office. He or she should be knowledgeable in the various dental procedures and be aware of their responsibilities. At the end of a procedure, the patient is escorted to the reception area. The assistant returns to the treatment room, cleans the treatment room, sterilizes the instruments, and sets the room up in preparation of the next patient. While many dental assistants experience a similar workday, there may be differences depending on the dental practice and staff. A dental assistant needs to be familiar with procedures and protocol in her or his particular dental office and perform accordingly. Some dental practices begin the day with a morning meeting. This is a time when members of the dental team meet and review the patient charts for that day. There is discussion on procedures to be done, any special equipment that will be needed, and which operatories are to be used. If a chart notes personality traits or special needs of a particular patient, that too is reviewed. The number of patients to treat is discussed as well as the overall schedule. Different dental practices may have different methods of preparing for the day. They may call their morning get-together a morning huddle or the day's rundown. Some offices may simply have a printout of patients to be seen. Whichever terminology or methods are used, a review of what lies ahead that day provides valuable insight for a smooth workday. Always remember, the patient's chart or daily schedule should not be located in an area where other patients can see them. To begin, the dental assistant should wash their hands thoroughly with soap and water. This is important as it kills certain bacteria and removes microorganisms from the hands. The dental team must wear appropriate personal protective equipment. Personal protective equipment includes gloves, gowns, masks, and protective eyewear. When participating in a procedure, there is potential for contact with fluids such as blood, saliva, or mucus. Personal protective equipment not only protects the dental assistant, but the entire dental team by reducing exposure to patient blood and saliva. Personal protective equipment also protects the patient by helping reduce the risk of transmitting diseases by cross-contamination. Before and after wearing gloves, the dental assistant must always wash her or his hands. Gloves are to be changed between patients or if a tear occurs. For cleaning, disinfecting, or sterilization procedures, utility gloves are to be worn. The utility gloves should be washed with soap and water before removing. Gowns or other protective clothing, such as lab coats and uniforms, are to be changed daily or when they become visibly soiled. All protective clothing is to be laundered in the dental office 
or by a professional service. Personal protective equipment is never taken home. Protective eyewear or glasses is another form of personal protective equipment. Before a procedure, the dental staff and the patient need to put on protective eyewear. Each patient should receive a clean pair of glasses. Eyewear helps to protect mucous membranes from spatter of fluids during dental procedures. The dental assistant's glasses are to be cleaned as necessary and disinfected at the end of the day. Depending on the procedure to be performed, goggles or a face shield may be worn. Prescription eyeglasses may be worn, but they must be fitted with side shields. During dental treatment, a mask is to be worn by the dentist and dental assistant. They are to be changed between patients. Masks protect the face and mucous membranes from potential spatter containing blood or saliva. If the mask becomes wet, it should be changed during the procedure. Masks should fit properly and be handled only by the tie strings or elastic. They should never be worn around the neck. Operatories, also called treatment rooms, should be clean from the night before. However, at the start of the day, it is best to thoroughly clean and disinfect the rooms before the first patient arrives. This includes cabinets and handles, light handles, countertops, the x-ray head, tray tables, chair and headrest, the high-speed evacuator, tubing for hand pieces, and the air water syringe. Once disinfected, a plastic cover is placed over the light handles, the x-ray head, and the patient chair, including chair controls that will be touched during the procedure. Plastic sleeves are placed over equipment, such as the air water syringe and high-speed evacuator. The plastic acts as a barrier to protect equipment from contamination caused by spatter or spray. This aids in the prevention of disease transmission. After a patient has been treated, the plastic barriers are removed and put into a leak-proof container for disposal according to national and or state or local regulations. Areas of the treatment room with the potential for contamination should be disinfected before the next patient is treated. After the treatment room has been disinfected, new plastic barriers are put into place for the next patient. A schedule for cleaning dental unit water lines should be established. For additional information on infection control and proper sterilization and disinfection methods, OSHA guidelines should be referenced. A dental practice may have different setups for different procedures. Often, the trays are set up according to the various procedures to be done that day. Some dental offices incorporate color-coded preset trays to aid in operatory setup. These trays may be preset the night before according to the different procedures used in the office. If there are any questions on the correct procedure of the patient treatment room setup, a supervisor should be contacted. When the patient arrives at the office, she or he should be greeted in the reception room by name. The dental assistant should be pleasant and help make the patient feel relaxed and comfortable. Notes on file regarding the patient's personal life, like an upcoming marriage or recent career change, should be mentioned. This lets the patient know that she or he is cared about and that the dental staff recognizes the patient's importance and individuality. It also helps alleviate any anxiety the patient may have regarding the upcoming dental treatment. By conveying a positive, friendly, and relaxed attitude, the dental assistant is establishing a comfortable feeling for the patient. The patient is escorted to the operatory and instructed to sit in the chair. If needed, the chair is to be adjusted so the patient can sit down easily. The patient napkin is then put on and protective eyewear is explained and given to the patient for the upcoming procedure. The next step is reviewing the patient's medical history. The dental assistant notes any current medical problems and all medications, both prescription and over-the-counter, that the patient is taking. It is important that all medications are listed. 
certain drugs may interfere with the dental treatment and cause complications. It may also affect what type of drugs the dentist may prescribe post-treatment. Questions regarding the patient's general health should be asked. The dental assistant should inquire if the patient has allergies or has had a recent hospital stay. Questions about diet and personal habits, such as smoking and drinking, should also be asked. All answers should be recorded in the patient's chart, signed and dated. A thorough review of the patient's medical history may aid in the prevention of potential complications during treatment. It may also help in the diagnosis of oral diseases or alert the dentist that the patient requires a referral to a specialist. Blood pressure is then taken and written in the patient's chart. Blood pressure readings may detect high blood pressure or hypertension. An abnormal reading should be brought to the attention of both the dentist and the patient. This procedure may be extremely valuable health information for the patient. Before beginning any dental procedure, the dental team and patient are to wear the appropriate personal protective equipment. Depending on the dental practice and the patient procedure scheduled, the assistant may take impressions, x-rays, or perform an oral screening before the patient sees the dentist. An oral screening procedure aids the dentist in recognizing any abnormalities that may be affecting the patient's health. Although not licensed to make a diagnosis, the dental assistant may do a preliminary exam looking for any lumps, discoloration, or abnormalities in the patient's oral cavity, as well as obvious areas of decay. Any abnormalities noticed should be mentioned to the dentist before informing the patient. If allowed in your state, the dental assistant may take patient x-rays. Depending on the practice or dentist, the dentist may request an x-ray after he or she has done a preliminary exam of the patient's mouth. The dental x-ray, also called a radiograph, aids the dentist in locating problems not visible during the oral exam. Radiographs are the images created on film during the x-ray process. Dentistry utilizes many different types of radiographs. The most common are periapical radiographs, bite-wing radiographs, full-mouth series radiographs, and panoramic radiographs. The periapical radiograph displays two or three teeth in their entirety, including the roots and crowns, along with sections of the surrounding tissue. Generally, the dentist uses this type of film when looking for problems of the root and surrounding tissues. The bite wing radiograph displays crowns on the upper and lower arches. It is often used since it is an excellent aid in detecting cavities between the teeth. The film comes in a variety of sizes. The full mouth series radiograph combines the bite wing and periapical radiographs, displaying all of the teeth, the roots, and the surrounding structures. The panoramic radiograph displays all of the teeth and much of the jaw and bone structure. It is rectangular in shape and is typically 12 inches long by 5 inches high. Regulations concerning dental assistants exposing radiographs vary from state to state. The dental assistant needs to be familiar with these regulations, along with the various types of radiographs and x-ray machines, to help minimize radiation to himself or herself and to the patient. To begin, the assistant confirms that the control panel, exposure button, tube head, and countertops are covered. This aids in infection control and helps prevent potential disease transmission. The dental assistant should wear the appropriate personal protective equipment, gloves, gown, mask, and protective eyewear. Then the dental assistant places a lead apron and thyroid shield over the patient. The lead apron and thyroid shield aid in minimizing scatter radiation exposure to the patient's body. Faster speeds of film help reduce radiation to the patient because less exposure time is needed. The appropriate type of film is chosen based on the type of x-ray required. 
There are many different types of X-ray machines available today. Standard X-ray machines are used for taking bite wing and periapical X-rays. When using a standard X-ray machine, the film is placed into a film holder, and the film and film holder are placed in the patient's mouth. There are several different types of holders, depending on the type of X-ray to be taken, the operator's preference, or the size of the patient's mouth. A standard in all dental offices is the placement of the exposure button outside of the room where the X-ray machine is located. This helps protect the dental assistant from the potentially harmful effects of repeated radiation exposure. Many offices use X-ray monitoring devices to ensure the dental assistant is not receiving scatter radiation. When the dental assistant is a minimum of six feet away from the X-ray machine, he or she activates the exposure button and takes the X-ray. Upon re-entering the room, the film is removed from the patient's mouth. If another X-ray is to be taken, the assistant repeats the process. When all X-rays have been taken, the assistant takes off the patient's lead apron and thyroid collar. The Panorex, or Panalypse X-ray machine, is used to take panoramic X-rays which display all of the teeth and much of the jaw and bone structure. For this radiograph, the film must be loaded into a cassette. This must be done in the dark room, or the film will be ruined. The assistant puts the cassette into the holder in the X-ray machine. In panoramic X-rays, the film is outside the patient's mouth. Ask the patient to remove all earrings, jewelry, hearing devices, or any other removable head accessory, as they will appear on the X-ray and may block an area that the dentist needs to view. Similar to the standard X-ray machine procedure, the assistant exits the room and exposes the X-ray. When done, the assistant re-enters the room, lifts the machine up, and removes the lead apron. The cassette containing the film is removed and taken into the dark room to be developed. Film can be developed manually or automatically. Generally, the film is developed immediately. The dental assistant may use an automatic developer with a daylight loader or go into a dark room to develop the film as daylight will expose and ruin the film. Digital X-ray machines are also becoming more common. These machines store radiographic images and information on a computer instead of film. Images can be displayed on a computer monitor or a computer printout. The sensor that is placed in the patient's mouth comes in two to three sizes and is not flexible. The sensor should be covered with a plastic sleeve before placement interorally and disinfected between patients. Sensors are fragile and procedures for disinfection should be carried out according to the manufacturer's instructions. There are many different types of developers available today. The developers used are chosen by dental practice preference. The dental assistant needs to be familiar with the x-ray machine used in her or his dentist's office as well as the specific procedure for developing x-ray film. If uncertain about any portion of the x-ray procedure, the dental assistant should contact a supervisor for help. One of the things that we do here in our dental office is we have a dental assisting school. This school will really give you the confidence and prepare you to succeed in the dental field. We get to learn and see everything that they do. So if a dental field is something that you are wanting to grow in, it's perfect for that. Another responsibility of a dental assistant is to take impressions for study models. The dental assistant should first instruct the patient on the procedure and what to expect. To begin, the dental assistant confirms that the materials necessary to make the impression are present. The materials needed include a mixing bowl for combining the water and alginate, a spatula used to mix, alginate impression material, water to mix with the alginate, and metal or plastic impression trays used to hold the impression material. 
The dental assistant is ready to make the impression by mixing water and alginate in the mixing bowl with the spatula. The manufacturer's instructions are to be followed, as different brands of alginate require a different ratio of powder to water. The material is then put into an impression tray that is the correct size for the patient's arch and placed into the mouth. The assistant holds the impression tray for approximately one minute or until the material sets and removes it from the mouth. The impression tray is then rinsed, disinfected, and placed on a tray, making sure the patient's name and the date are noted. If the impression is not to be poured immediately, it should be rinsed, disinfected, wrapped in a moist paper towel, and placed in a sealed plastic bag or humidor. A wax or a silicone bite also needs to be created. It is used as a reference to the patient's occlusion or bite pattern. This can be done at the start of the impression procedure or it can be done after the impressions have been made. The wax or the silicone bite is utilized later in trimming the study model. For both materials, the manufacturer's guidelines and instructions should be consulted. Depending on the dental practice, the impressions for the study model can be completed after the patient leaves, when there is a gap in the schedule, or at the end of the day. Study models are important as they help the dentist make a diagnosis and plan for treatment. The study model materials, typically gypsum, plaster, and water, are mixed together. The instructions for specific materials should be consulted. Once mixed, the gypsum is vibrated to remove trapped air bubbles caused during mixing. Small amounts of gypsum are vibrated into the impression to evenly cover all tooth surfaces. When the impression has filled with gypsum, a base is made and the impression tray containing the gypsum mixture is inverted onto the top of the base. While setting, a chemical reaction takes place and the gypsum material is warm and damp. It will take roughly 45 to 60 minutes for the mold to set. Once set, the material is cool and dry to the touch. The study model is then separated from the impression tray. The model now needs to be trimmed. The proper equipment as well as the model are prepared. The assistant should have a wax or a silicone bite to reference the occlusion, a pencil to draw a line on the model, a model trimmer to grind and trim away the gypsum, a compass protractor to properly trim a model, specific angles predetermined by the dentist should be created, and a laboratory knife for trimming and cutting the model material. To begin trimming, the dental assistant removes the excess material at the area behind the back molars as it may interfere with the bite of the model. Often the dentist will give specific instructions as well as a preferred angle to be used. A supervisor should be consulted as to the preferred technique used in trimming a model. After the model is carefully trimmed, it is smoothed and polished. The dental assistant should place the upper and lower models together in bite position on a flat surface and line up with the wax or silicone bite. The occlusion of the model should exactly match that of the bite impression. An exact match ensures the study model correctly matches the patient's occlusion. For a smooth overall appearance, the dental assistant needs to finish the model. The model is soaked in soapy water for 24 hours, allowed to dry, and then buffed to a high gloss with a soft cloth. When complete, the assistant writes the patient's name and date on the model with a model marker or on a stick-on label. A well-trimmed model conveys a professional attitude and reinforces to the patient that the office staff pays attention to every detail. Different dental practices have different methods and procedures. If uncertain, the dental assistant should ask a supervisor. It is now time for the dentist to perform an exam. 
the dental assistant should bring to the attention of the dentist any changes in the patient's health history. And when you're trained the right way, it just makes our job so much easier. Uh, it's a great career. You can make some really good money. You get to help people and you're motivated in, in making people feel comfortable and welcome in an office. Uh, you're such a huge asset to an office like ours. Chairside assisting is one of the most important aspects of a dental assistant's day. Familiarity with the names and purposes of the instruments and handpieces allow the procedure to occur efficiently and without unnecessary movement. Setups differ depending on the dental practice and the dentist's personal preference. The dental assistant needs to be familiar with the correct setups for his or her dental office. During the dental procedure, the dental assistant should remain conscious of infection control procedures and keeping the treatment room clean and surfaces disinfected. Sharp instruments should be handled carefully, as they may easily cut gloves or hands. Needles should never be recapped using two hands. Needles must always be recapped using a special recapping device or with the one-handed scoop method. They should be discarded as soon as possible into a sharps container. Touching equipment, drawer handles, or switches that are not protected by a plastic barrier should be avoided. The dental assistant should also try to avoid entering cabinets or drawers wearing contaminated gloves. If it is necessary to enter a cabinet or a drawer, the assistant should create a barrier using clean gloves or aluminum foil. If no barriers are available, the contaminated gloves are to be removed and hands washed before entering the area. When done in the drawer, the assistant must wash hands and re-glove. Dental practices should utilize ergonomic principles in the arrangement of work areas and equipment selected in their dental office. Ergonomic principles are an important asset to the dental team. Using ergonomic principles helps reduce stress and fatigue for the dental team. With this reduction, the dentist and dental assistant have fewer distractions and they can fully concentrate on the patient. It also helps prevent potential injury and nerve disorders that may occur due to incorrect seating positions. Proper seating also plays a key role in an efficient dental procedure. The correct positioning and location of handpieces, instruments, and chairs aid in an ergonomically friendly office. It is necessary that access to the patient is not blocked, that all equipment and instruments are easily accessible, and that the dentist, assistant, and patient are comfortable. Optimal sitting positions for the dentist and the dental assistant during treatment procedures are important. The dentist should always have a clear line of sight into the patient's oral cavity. The assistant's head should be four to six inches higher than the dentist's, with thighs parallel to the floor and knees pointed forward, toward the front of the dental chair. The stool is placed as close as possible to the patient's chair, and the front edge is to be parallel to the patient's mouth. Most importantly, there needs to be easy access to all necessary equipment and to the patient's mouth. When passing instruments, a limited amount of movement is best. Movement of the shoulders or torso should be avoided if possible. This will help save time and energy, as well as reduce fatigue and stress of the body. Instruments and materials should be arranged in the order they will be needed during the procedure. The workspace needs to be as close to the patient as possible. A dental assistant should try to anticipate the dentist's instrument needs, but remain flexible if the procedure does not run the typical course. Many times throughout the day, the dental assistant will be assisting the dentist in providing anesthesia. Anesthesia plays a key role in the dental office by helping reduce potential pain for a patient. Some general types of anesthetics include topical anesthetics, nitrous oxide, and local anesthetics. A topical anesthetic 
is typically used in conjunction with a local anesthetic. Depending on the state of residency, the dental assistant may be allowed to administer a topical anesthetic. Another type of anesthesia is local anesthesia. Local anesthesia works by blocking pain impulses from being sent to the brain. There are many types of local anesthetics used in dentistry. The type of local anesthetic used in treatment depends on the dentist's judgment and the dental practice. The dental assistant should be familiar with the anesthetic setup as it allows for an efficient procedure. The anesthetic setup includes topical anesthetic and cotton swabs, cartridges, which contain the local anesthetic, an aspirating syringe, which holds the local anesthesia and needle, needles, used to inject the local anesthesia. Needles come in different lengths and gauges and are chosen depending on the type and amount of anesthesia to be used, the injection site, and on dentist preference. And a needle recapping device, which is used to prevent accidental needle sticks. What does it take to get started? Uh, a lot of times you think that there's all these prerequisites and things that you need beforehand. Dental assisting school is just, you just need a desire to, to learn and to want to help other people. And really that's about it. If you got those two things, then you know, you're, you're well, well on your way into, into becoming a dental assistant. Typically, before a local anesthetic is injected, a topical anesthetic is applied with a cotton swab to the area to reduce the discomfort from the needle. The dental assistant assembles the syringe containing the local anesthetic. The dentist injects the anesthetic while the dental assistant continues to support in the procedure by passing and retrieving instruments. During a dental procedure, while the assistant is aiding the dentist, it is also wise to keep an eye on the patient. If at any time the patient appears nervous, the dental assistant should attempt to comfort the patient. Verbal reassurance may be necessary. The assistant might tell the patient what is the next portion of the procedure, the amount of time remaining, or simply that the procedure is nearing the end. Keeping the patient calm helps the procedure to run smoothly without potential complications. Once the needle has been used, there is a risk of contamination for the dental staff. When anesthetic administration is complete, the needle should be recapped using either the one-handed scoop method or by using a specialized device for needle recapping. Once the dental treatment is done, the dental assistant carefully removes the needle from the syringe and disposes of it into a sharps container. The syringe must be properly cleaned and sterilized before using it with the next patient. If there are questions regarding an anesthetic procedure or type of anesthetic or needle to be used, the dental assistant should ask a supervisor or the dentist involved in the procedure. Working with Alex is really fun. He really emphasizes the fun part and um, he really knows what he's doing in terms of marketing and you know his own uh, field of expertise. And he has a lot of great ideas, uh, some ideas I've never even heard of, but I'm definitely willing to try. Depending on the type of procedure that is to be done, the dentist may request that a rubber dam is used. A rubber dam isolates specific teeth to be treated. The field of vision for the dentist is increased when using a rubber dam since saliva, blood, the tongue, and lips are not able to intrude upon the isolated area. Rubber dams also aid in infection control. They help prevent injury to the soft tissues of the patient's mouth while keeping the operating area dry. Rubber dams help the patient by reducing the length of the procedure and preventing him or her from swallowing or aspirating any materials. During the preparation of a rubber dam placement, the dental assistant needs to be familiar with the procedure and the instruments being used. A typical rubber dam setup includes a topical anesthetic, lubricant for the patient's lips, rubber dam material for isolating the tooth, it is a flexible material that comes in a range of thickness and colors. 
The thickness of the material used depends on the space between the teeth to be isolated. A rubber dam frame for holding the rubber dam material in place. Frames come in plastic or metal. Rubber dam clamps for stabilizing rubber dam material during the procedure. Clamps are winged or wingless depending on the tooth. Clamps may also be referred to as general purpose, which prevents gum intrusion, or high bow, which provides additional clearance at the crown of the tooth. Rubber dam forceps for placing and removing a rubber dam clamp. A rubber dam punch for cutting the holes in the rubber dam material where the teeth will come through the material. A plastic instrument for tucking under the rubber dam's edges into the sulcus. And scissors for cutting the rubber dam material that is between the teeth when the procedure is complete. The assistant needs to anticipate the dentist's needs and immediately act upon any requests or signals. Some dental practices and dentists may have different methods or instrument preferences. Also, some states allow the assistant to place the rubber dam in the mouth. The dental assistant should review the proper procedures as well as the instruments before the patient is in the operatory. If any questions arise, he or she should ask a supervisor. Hand pieces are the tools that hold polishing and cutting instruments called burrs. They are also utilized in the laboratory, for example, in fabrication of custom trays. Hand pieces are attached to an air compressor and at one time were called the dentist drill. The conventional speed and the high speed hand pieces are the two types typically used. High speed hand pieces are typically used to cut bone and teeth to remove old restorations, and to finish new restorations. Due to the friction caused by the high speeds, heat is produced. The handpiece is equipped with a water coolant system, which when activated, cools the burr by spraying it with water. It also may be equipped with a fiber optic light, which enhances the dentist's visibility. The conventional speed or slow speed hand pieces are often used to finish and polish restorations in teeth and to remove decay and stains from teeth. Although slower than the high speed hand pieces, there are times when the hand piece produces friction. The dental assistant is responsible for using the air water syringe to aid in heat reduction. The slow speed hand piece utilizes several different attachments. The attachments include a prophylaxis angle, which aids in polishing teeth, a contra angle, which allows for greater access range in the oral cavity and can hold burrs for removal of decay or polishing restorations, and a straight attachment, which is utilized in laboratory procedures. Conventional speed handpiece attachments used interorally must be disposed of or sterilized between patients. Burrs and rotary cutting attachments connect to the handpiece. Burrs have many purposes that range from cutting to finishing to smoothing a tooth. Preparation burrs are used to cut the tooth surface. Finishing burrs are used to polish and trim the restorative materials. Burrs and rotary cutting attachments used interorally must be sterilized between patients. Rotary cutting attachments are mainly used for cutting, polishing, and finishing a tooth. Rotary instruments include stones for finishing a composite. Stones come in many different sizes and grits or levels of abrasion. Mandrels are steel shanks that hold wheels and discs for the handpiece. One of the most utilized trays in general dentistry is the composite tray. A composite restoration tray contains several different setups and instruments. The instruments and setups may vary depending on the dental staff and dentist preference. A typical composite restoration tray would include the basic setup with a mouth mirror, an explorer, cotton pliers, a periodontal probe for measuring gingival sulcus depth, and gauze 
for retraction and absorbing excess moisture. The rubber dam setup. The anesthetic setup. Additional materials and instruments on a composite restoration tray include cotton rolls for soaking up excess moisture during a dental procedure and for isolating a tooth or an area of the oral cavity. Shade guides for establishing the color of the restoration so it matches the shade of the tooth. A spoon excavator for excavating soft caries. An acid etching agent for preparing the enamel surface. It causes irregularities in the tooth surface, allowing the bonding agent to function better. A bonding agent attaches to the irregularities of a tooth, allowing composite resin to better adhere. A plastic instrument for placing a variety of materials into the cavity preparation. Composite resin comes in a variety of shades, from matching the restoration to the patient's natural teeth. A wedge for separating the teeth. Articulating paper and holder for denoting a patient's bite pattern. The paper contains an ink-like substance that transfers onto a patient's teeth when the patient bites down on it. A rubber cup and pumice for polishing the restoration. Polishing paste used to smooth the composite material after placing in the tooth. And any hand instruments the dentist may request. There are many different instruments that are part of a particular tray setup. Most dentists have particular instruments they prefer to use. If the dental assistant is unsure about what the dentist's favorite instruments are, she or he should inquire. In a composite procedure, the dental assistant utilizes the shade guide to verify the color of the restoration will accurately match the color of the patient's natural teeth before the rubber dam is placed while the tooth is still moist. If you're great at being a dental assistant, you'll have a job anywhere. You'll have dentists uh, knocking, knocking on your door 24-7 trying to, trying to win you over because you're, you're so invaluable to us. The dentist uses a high-speed handpiece with a preparation burr to cut the tooth surface. As the procedure unfolds, the dental assistant should suction as needed using the High Volume Evacuator, or HVE. This helps keep the area dry by removing saliva and debris from the mouth, which allows the dentist's field of vision to remain unobstructed and cuts down on spatter. An acid etching agent is then applied to the tooth in order to prepare the enamel surface. This causes irregularities in the tooth surface, allowing the bonding agent to function better. The bonding agent is then applied, and the tooth is ready to accept the composite resin. The dentist then inserts the composite resin with a composite filling instrument. A curing light may be used to aid in the hardening process between layers. The dental assistant cures the material, and the dentist repeats the process of filling the tooth. Once the composite is cured, the rubber dam is to be removed. The dental assistant is responsible for holding the patient's cheek away from the scissors, passing and retrieving instruments when necessary, and using the air and water syringe and HVE to rinse and evacuate the patient's mouth. Once complete, the occlusion is checked and the final finishing takes place. Typically, the dentist utilizes several different handpiece attachments when finishing and polishing a composite. A finishing burr is attached to trim and polish the composite. A finishing strip is used which utilizes sandpaper to smooth the sides of the composite. Stones may be attached for finishing, and composite finishing points or discs may be used for polishing. The dental assistant should be aware of the dentist's preference in handpiece attachments, but also be ready when asked for a particular instrument. Once complete, the assistant uses the air water syringe and HVE to remove any other debris and leave the patient with a clean mouth. The light is moved away from the patient's face 
and the assistant hands the patient a mirror to view the new restoration. When the dental assistant knows the procedure to be done and has a tray efficiently set up, procedures occur fluidly with minimal fatigue and stress for the dental team and patient. Once the procedure has been completed, gloves, masks, and any contaminated personal protective equipment should be removed. Any necessary follow-up actions for the patient need to be explained and any questions answered. The patient is then escorted to the reception area. Depending on the dental practice, the dental assistant may be required to put the patient's file away and collect the new file for the upcoming patient. Before the next patient is brought in, the treatment room must be cleaned. The dental assistant washes her or his hands and puts on utility gloves. Plastic barriers from the lights, chair, and x-ray head are removed. This helps prevent potential contamination and protects the dental staff and the patients. Used cotton balls or gauze need to be disposed of in special biohazard containers. The assistant brings the instrument tray with the used instruments to a cleanup sterilization area. Countertops and other uncovered environmental work services are disinfected, as well as any area of the room that was contaminated by spatter. New plastic barriers will be replaced before the next patient. The assistant may return to the sterilization area to clean the instruments if there is time between patients. Breaking up and removing heavy debris can be done by hand or by using an ultrasonic cleaner. Using an ultrasonic cleaner is the preferred method. When using an ultrasonic cleaner, the dental assistant places the dirty instruments into the ultrasonics basket. For proper cleaning, all instruments must be fully submerged in the solution and the basket must not be overfilled. If the basket is overfilled, the instruments will not be cleaned. The lid is then closed and the ultrasonic cleaner is turned on. The instruments remain in the ultrasonic for approximately 15 minutes. The basket may be removed and the instruments are rinsed, checked for cleanliness, dried, and put into a sealed and labeled bag or placed into cassettes. Since not all offices have an ultrasonic cleaner, an alternate cleaning method is scrubbing the instruments by hand using soap and water and a long-handled scrub brush. If scrubbing by hand, scrub under water, pointing the spray away from you, and wear utility gloves. Once cleaned, the instruments are rinsed thoroughly in tap water and then dried on a towel. When dried, they are bagged and put into a sealed and labeled bag in sterilization pouches or placed into cassettes. Sharp tips may be wrapped in gauze or foil to prevent puncturing the bags. Caution should be used when handling sharp or double-ended instruments. Puncture-resistant gloves should be used when cleaning sharp instruments. The next step is sterilization. The bagged instruments are placed into an autoclave for sterilization. The autoclave should not be overloaded in order to allow the steam to sufficiently kill all microbial forms. The temperature and pressure of the autoclave must reach the manufacturer's recommendation before the sterilization cycle can begin. Because of the pressure, an autoclave should never be opened until a safe internal temperature has been reached. If opened before the cycle has ended or before the unit has cooled, severe steam burns could occur. Check manufacturer's guidelines for a safe cooling temperature. When first removed from the autoclave, the instruments may be put in a drawer or on a tray designated for sterilized instruments as they are hot and need to cool. Once cool, the instruments may be put away. If there are any questions on proper sterilization procedure, the manufacturer's instructions are to be followed. Some dentist's office may use color-coded trays for different setups. The dental assistant presets trays according to specific procedures 
and places them in special cabinets. Instruments should not be removed from their sterilization bag until just before the patient's procedure is ready to begin. At the end of the day, the dental assistant should take inventory of what needs to be accomplished before closing. All operatories should be cleaned and disinfected for the following morning. If needed, Sharps containers should be properly disposed of in a biohazard container. Instruments should be sterile. If a clinic utilizes preset dental trays, the assistant should verify that there are enough ready for the following day. Study models should be finished. Any protective eyewear should be disinfected or sterilized. Protective gowns or clothes should be placed in the proper area to be laundered. Disposable gowns and masks should be placed in leak-proof marked bags for proper disposal. The last step for the dental assistant is to thoroughly wash his or her hands using an antimicrobial hand wash or soap. This helps prevent possible infectious disease transmission outside the office. All the financial aid that we have available, as well as just the cost itself, it's really very affordable. We'd love to hear from you. We'd, we'd love to have you in our next course and uh, welcome you with open arms to, to become a, a new dental assistant.